Well, as we know, the GOP last night was the GOP last night. <laughs> Cruz refuses to uh, support Trump. I wouldn't support Trump, but I'm a Democrat. Cruz is not. It's right now, um, I don't know. You know, I don't even know how to call this one. This is the craziest election I've ever seen. I've been voting since 1976. I don't know whether to just sit back or just watch it. Just watch it, let it happen. I mean, what what are you going to do? Oh, uh, i got to make my vote count. Either way, you, need, you should vote. The young people out there, you need to vote. And, you know, if you all, as con conglomerate, think my vote doesn't count, and you're all voting the same way, we've just lost a few thousand people on the voting. Oh. Electoral bill. It's. I think I said that right. But anyway, that's why you vote. You're not the only one who thinks that way. You're not the only one that says, I'm not going to vote. My vote doesn't count. It's, it's a cop out, number one. And, and number two, if you want a voice in America, you voice it. That's part of your rights. You know? If you can't say, Something about your government. Why I live in here? And that kind of irks me. It's like a lot of bitching and complaining from I want pot legal in every state to I want gay marriage to I want transgender rights to I want heterosexual rights. I want to be able to have orgies. I mean, very, very, very exaggerated, but true. If you don't vote on something that has been brought into the election, slowly, it has a better chance of getting there if you, if you vote for it. How do you think um, gay marriage got okay? It, got, it, it was okay through um, people voting you know, and saying, hey, these people are human? Transgender rights. How do you think that happened? You know, whether you vote no for them or yes for them, personally, I love them. Got a few transgenders in my life, and I do love them, and I care about them. And if people had voted for them, Things could be much worse for them. Education. Now, it's just not voting for the president on that. Tickets. Uh, school bills that needs to go through. They need more money. Fire department. Police department. You know, people don't think what goes into an election. It's just not the president of the United States. Or the vice president, which usually goes with the, vice, with the president of the United States. So there's no worries there. But there is worry about how we do not vote here. Some countries make their people vote. Yeah, we don't do that here. But I think we should. I think people have to vote. You know, if you need state aid... You should vote. If you wanted state aid, obviously you wouldn't have applied for it. But yet, no vote? No, up my taxes? Yes, I need to have this thing and that thing and I need dental and I need medical, I need all that. But yet, you won't vote. You have a lot, just don't vote. I don't care if you're a Republican. I don't care if you're a Democrat. I don't care if you're squeaky Dean Marie. It's none of your business to know what that is. But voting is the number one right of being American. You should be proud. If you're not proud, I don't know what to tell you. 
I have my opinion of it. It's a strong one. And, uh, you know, I think that's one thing that should be forced. You would vote or you'd get in trouble. I think prisoners should be allowed to vote. They're not allowed to vote. They lose all their voting rights. I know that. Not good. It's not good to not have an opinion. It's a, it's a suck out. You know? You want this, you want that, and you hear, oh, well, my government this, my government that. So, did you vote on it? Yeah. Want Mexicans out of your neighborhood? Say something. I don't want them to believe. You can say all you want. I'm still going to protect them. But you still need to vote on something or an issue, something you don't like. Whether you like it or not, you've got to vote. Because you do count. I don't have to agree with you. But I do want you to vote. Please. You ready for one of my stories? Everybody's heard of Big Al. Very cool pussycat. He was born on a farm in Falls City. His mother was a barn cat, a big barn cat. And his father was a bad hat. <laughs> he was a barn cat. They're beautiful. But they can get big and they'll eat your chickens. And the farmer said to his son, get rid of the litter, get rid of the, the female, get rid of the bobcat. Hunt him down. So the, the young man got his friends and they destroyed the female and the, and the kits and they found the male and shot him. But they kept one kit, tiny thing, eyes weren't even really open. Big baby. And my veterinarian at the time, who I always admire, Dr. Bishop, I've been seeing. Sammamish, Washington. At the time, it was just as well. Saved this little kid. Had this surgery on him. His nose had been broken. His tail had been busted off. He had a little tail anyway. But what was been really busted off? Ribs broke, and he thought, well, euthanizing him might be the best choice instead. He worked on this baby. A couple months later, I came in with my cat, whose name was Crimson, and she was a calico cat, and she was the queen of her home. She was a lovely cat. She was small, though, eight pounds. And she went in with a fever, and she had to stay the night at the hospital, the kitty hospital. And, um... I was sitting there the next day, going to pick up Crimson, and a tiny little thing crawled up my pant leg. Crawled right up my pant leg, sat on my lap, crawled up my blouse, and he's sticking to me now. And he sits on my shoulder, and he chirps. He does a meow. He goes, what the hell are you? And he stood about the stall, and I go, how old is he? He's about six, eight weeks old. He's badly damaged, blah, blah. He's so badly damaged, he had, by the way, he's polyductal. Polyductal. And so he could not retract his front claws. They had uh, broken his, his paws. And um, managed to save the paws. We took out the uh, claws, and only in the front. The back... I'm, I insist that they stay in case he gets out. He needed something somehow to protect himself. Now, mind you, he is wildlife now. Partial. He was legal in unincorporated, and he's illegal in incorporated. I lived in unincorporated at the time. 
As he grew, he became more and more personable. When my youngest son would bring home a girlfriend and shut his door, I'd come home from work and Al was standing at the front door waiting for me. And it was... I still remember the chirps. And I go, where is he? And that cat would run straight to Mike's room and sit up on the, on the antique radio and he was able to open the door. The first thing out of Mike's mouth <laughs> as I as Al ruined his whole puberty moment was <laughs> Damn you Al, you <laughs> you ran it on me again. Her snitch. <laughs> he was. Oh, anywhere from pot to mushrooms to more girls, you, you rattled, you told. Finally, <laughs> Mike wouldn't do it at home anymore because of the cat. And he adored that cat. Yeah. And my uh, grandmother made uh, Mike a, a blanket that was red and had little ties to it. And Al would get on it and knead it and suck on one of the little towels, on a little things because he thought it was a nip. Um, he'd uh, been bottle fed but not properly weighed and I mean it's hard, come on, you know. He couldn't be let out in the wild anymore after all the surgeries he had. He had no clue how to survive. Then to top it off, having his claws removed was not, uh, it was not going to be a good um, thing to happen. So anyway, Al Gordon. And people would come and see Al. Had a couple of police officers wanting to meet this cat. And then they'd send me the, the section in the book that I'm not allowed to have him. When I'm an unincorporated, I can have him as long as he's not outside. And if he's outside, then I have to have a wild cat um, area. And they have curly barbed wire on top, and, you know, they're locked in. And um, and I said, and I preferred not to lock him in. I was keeping him in the house. And Al never went outside because he was certain there was something out there that must have been scary to make me stay, him stay inside. Crimson would go outside. He thought she was brave. That's all she would have to do. He'd be coming down the corner and she'd go, Psst, and he'd jump 12 feet in the air. <laughs> so anyway, one day he was sitting in the apartment window. Looking at the sun, bless his heart, and Crimson's at the end of the hall. She's looking at him. She looked at me, and I'm like, oh, no, you don't. And she took the biggest run I've ever seen a cat go, and she leaped up in the air and pushed him to the screen. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my God. So anyway, bad booba kitty. <laughs> I shut the window go outside and he's sitting out there crying his eyes out. He's scared, shaking. And then that same night, my girlfriend brought over, uh, oh, what were they? A lopso opso. They were puppies and she was going to give me one. Well, Al didn't know what it was and he hid on top of the refrigerator. <laughs> he's like, oh, it's no, I'm not coming down. I don't know what that is, but it's Tiny, it barks. It's like, and like, it's like a moth, you know. Anyway, he died in November of 2004 from lymphoma and kidney leukemia, which he was born with. And he went through chemotherapy. He's the only cat that I ever had that I hired hospice. Yes, there was hospice for cats and dogs, and even your bunny rabbits. But yes, his last days were spent walking grass in the backyard with me. He'd never been outside, and I decided to do that for him. He'd stop and he'd smell a flower. He'd look at me, and he was real thin. Then. I'm a 40-pound cat now, too. Maybe ten pounds. So the day came in the hosp 
this worker came to him, and she said, Shining it, God will let him go. I wrapped him up in his blanket and put his thumb in his mouth. And he went softly to sleep. He would have liked that. I should get it.